All right. Fall 2020. Analog lab semester. Let's see how this goes. Okay. I'm just going to check my settings. Let's see if we're we're live, and then we'll get into it. <laughs> cool. Okay, I think we're all good. <clears throat> okay, so uh, just as kind of an introduction to what's happening here, uh, I've decided to live stream the lessons on Sundays uh, for each week. And I will archive these to YouTube and post them on our class website, so you can watch them at your leisure. Uh, but because I'm recording these videos and doing these lessons anyway, I figured uh, it might be a good idea to just allow people to hop into the Twitch chat, hop into our Discord server, and ask questions during the lesson. Um, because sometimes I might not, you know, cover something so clearly. Sometimes, uh, you know. There's, there might be something that's confusing, and uh, I'd love for people to ask questions in real time. So, it's not required, but um, it is welcome. So, I'm in our Discord voice chat. Uh, I have the Twitch chat open as well. So, if anyone has any questions about any of this material, um, just ask. Okay. So, I said I was starting at 9 o'clock, it's 8.59, so I'm just going to give this one more minute, um, just in case people decided to tune in before we actually start. I'm going to pop back over to our website here. All right, nine o'clock, let's get started. So, um, this is the class website. This is going to be uh, the resource for analog lab, analog lecture, digital lab, and digital lecture. The website, which you probably can't tell because you can't read the URL, it's NYU Music Tech Electronics Labs, this whole title right at the top, uh, dot wordpress dot com. Uh, so I will send this out in an email uh, so that you can read over the syllabus and uh, every lab will be posted here. So if you can't find it, you can always click on the site and um, find all the resources for this class. So I'm going to go over kind of the, um, the syllabus for this class and um, the parts and tools. I know I've sent a bunch of emails already, um, but I just want to clarify everything before we start, and um, then we'll dive into this week's lesson. So, uh, I clicked on Analog Lab. If you just go to NYU Music Tech Electronics Labs.wordpress.com, you'll get the latest post, which may not be for this class. So just click on Analog. Uh, when you get here. I realize you can't see the mouse on the screen, so I'll kind of try to point out where I'm clicking. 
uh, when you click on Analog Lab, you should see Analog Lab Fall 2020. If you see Digital Lab, you're in the wrong place. If you see Analog Lab Spring 2020, you're in the wrong place. Um, this class is going to be pretty different from past semesters, as you might imagine. Um, so please make sure you see Fall 2020 here. Um, I'm just going to kind of show you what's on this page. The syllabus link is at the top. Uh, the required parts and tools is linked here. Um, I want to highlight this paragraph. Because this class requires students to build and test analog circuits, the trajectory of the semester might change from the outline. I understand that this is a remote class and students might have difficulty working on these projects. Um, so what I've done is I've linked to last year's syllabus so that you could see what this trajectory used to be um, in case, you know, we uh, change our course. There's also a link to our Discord server that you can join here. Um, this, uh, if you've not used Discord, it's basically just a chat uh, program where we can talk and post links. Um, there's different channels for different kinds of conversations. And I find that it's going to be a good place for us to have class discussions without having a classroom. Um, so please join. It's, it's pretty easy to figure out, and um, I will gladly help you uh, get situated in Discord. Um, I'm going to just click on last year's syllabus so you can get an idea of what this class is about. Um, this class is Analog Lab. It uh, goes hand in hand with Analog Lecture. And it's basically um, a project based class where we'll be building uh, circuits on a breadboard. Gonna get into that a little later. Uh, I think this class probably has two paths one is for uh, guitar pedal and effects pedal manufacturing, and the other is sort of synthesizer and modular synth uh, making. <clears throat> it's going to be super rudimentary, but that's the sort of things that we'll be building here. So uh, last year when we ran this class, uh, we did introduction to basic circuits, which is what we're going to do today. Uh, we're going to talk about some pretty basic building blocks of resistors, voltage dividers, power, uh, a couple laws that are, are sort of what you would learn in a, an intro to EE class, right? Um, soldering, which was a big part of this class, but is going to be very difficult because we are not going to have access to soldering irons. So I may do an overview of soldering, but uh, it's not going to be required this semester, unfortunately. Oscilloscopes, uh, these are also... Um, devices that live at the NYU lab that we won't have access to and we'll be using sort of a, a smaller version of what NYU has at the lab to analyze circuits. Uh, op amps, these are basically chips that um, can do a lot of different things, so we'll intro to them in week five. Uh, RC circuits and filters, oscillators, sensors, uh, and diodes. So these are all about nine weeks of lessons before we get into our final project. Uh, and so in the past, we've had one to three weeks of final project uh, in-class work days before the final projects are due. And then on the last week of class, there are presentations. So um, this is how this class used to run. This was fall 2019. This was one year ago. Um, and so I'm just going to go back to our syllabus, and um, I went back and forth a little bit on whether or not I wanted to keep final projects, because I think it's going to be a little bit difficult to do with this format. Um, however, I think even if uh, we keep final projects, I'll still have a short lesson each week. You may not have homework for the last couple of weeks if we decide to work on them. I think we'll have to see where we're at uh, the last couple of weeks of the semester. So I've kind of outlined a few lessons, um, and I, I think we'll kind of see where the class takes us and how everyone's doing with everything 
um, and this all might change. So uh, you can see like the first couple weeks are roughly the same, but we might switch things up as the semester goes on. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to just talk about the syllabus a little bit. Um, so this is a lab class. And that means that each week you will be building and analyzing an analog circuit. Uh, so basically your entire class is gonna be based on completing these lessons each week and putting them together on a blog post and sending them to me uh, each week. Instead of uh, making our class time mandatory because I, I know there are people who are not based in New York. I know there are a few people in California and 9.30 a.m. means 6.30 a.m. Uh, there's also people in China. It kind of doesn't make sense to maybe do um, an in-class uh, scheduled time. So what I want to do is I want to have mandatory office hours with each person uh, once a week, just to have a check-in so we can talk and understand uh, if you're getting the material. I'm still going to pop in to Zoom at 9.30 on Monday and 9.30 on Friday, depending on what your class is, introduce the new lesson, uh, ask a couple of questions, uh, and then just leave you to watch the video. So I will be on Zoom, I'll send out the links, but the mandatory attendance will be this office hours once a week for about 15 minutes. Um, you know, some of you might think that you're doing okay and you don't need the 15 minutes with me. That's totally fine. Some of you might need extra help, in which case you might need more time than this once a week meeting. And to that, I would say... Um, I want to use the Discord for that kind of uh, extra help just because I'm going to be scheduling time with every student, so I want to make sure it's fair. Um, but I will be checking the Discord on a daily basis. You can post questions. I will be checking it and uh, responding there. Uh, it's also a place where we can have a class discussion. So if you have questions about anything, you know, bring it up in the Discord and maybe another classmate um, can help with it if I'm not available. Um, I mentioned this already during class time, we will introduce the lesson for the upcoming week uh, and invite questions, but this will be optional and attendance will only be taken for office hours. Uh, you can also email me if you prefer email. Uh, I try to respond within 24 hours um, if you need extra help. So that's how we're going to run this class. Um, I'm going to try and stream this on Sunday night at 9 o'clock uh, if you want to follow along. If not, you can just watch the archived videos, and then we'll have our face-to-face -to -face touch in. That, that will be kind of how this class is run. There is no textbook for this class. Um, we are building things, so we have a list of parts, and I'm going to get to that when I'm done here. So... Um, you know, the money that you would have spent on a textbook, you're going to spend on parts. It's uh, a little bit more than $100. Uh, I understand that shipping may have bumped this up closer to $200. Um, I'll talk about this in a little bit. The class goals. Uh, so this is a hands-on class. We'll be building, analyzing, and troubleshooting basic analog circuits. With extra emphasis on circuits of interest for those of us who study music and audio. Right? This is music tech. So we are building uh, audio circuits. These circuits are the foundation of more sophisticated recording and production equipment, synthesizers, and effects units that you see every day. Our goal for this class, in conjunction with the lecture, is to give you a basic working knowledge of analog electronics so that you will leave with the skills to design, build, and troubleshoot real-life analog audio circuits. I just want to kind of set expectations here because I think people come into this class and think they're going to build a professional rack unit reverb and I kind of want to shatter those dreams up front. We're starting from a super basic building block and so um, I'm going to show you projects from semesters past 
and you can kind of see what um, people are building in this class. You're not going to build a piece of pro audio equipment in this class. Um, students have built guitar pedals. Students have built synthesizers. Uh, students have really gotten creative and put these concepts together to build things I've never seen before. And we'll look at some of those in a little bit. Um, but I kind of, I want to use this class to teach you the foundation, uh, the foundations of analog circuits. So, uh, lab reports, every week for most of the semester, you will spend your time doing a lab assignment in which you will build one or more analog circuits, then observe, measure, and experiment while recording and analyzing the results. What does this mean? You're going to build a circuit on a breadboard. When it does the thing that it's supposed to do, you'll take a video on your phone and you will put that somewhere. Um, I'm gonna talk about the blogs in a little bit. You're pretty much going to send me a blog post with a video, some measurements that you took, maybe some math that you did uh, a summary of what the assignment was. And this will all be posted on the website so you can read over. For every assignment, you'll do a lab report in which you'll explain in your own words what you did, how it worked, what you learned, and answer any questions I put in the questions section of the assignment. This will be pretty obvious once we start the lesson. Your lab reports every week must take the form of entries on a WordPress blog and must be emailed to your instructor by 5 p.m. the day before our next class. Uh, what does this mean? If you have a blog already that you would prefer to use instead of WordPress, that's totally fine. WordPress.com is the easiest place to set up a blog. If you have never used a blogging system before, I would suggest WordPress. Uh, however, use your own WordPress system that, or uh, your own blogging system, that's totally fine. Um, as long as you email it to me by 5 p.m. the day before class. So for my Monday class, that is Sunday at 5 p.m. For my Friday class, that is Thursday at 5 p.m please hand it in on time. Lab reports are graded on a scale of zero to five. You get one point off for a lab handed in late. So this is really important because students have lost a lot of credit for handing in late lab reports. Please hand your lab reports in on time. Even if you are confused about what you're doing, if you don't understand something, turn it in you'll at least get credit for getting it in on time. For the last few weeks of class, as I explained earlier, you'll take everything you learned and design, build, and extensively document a unique custom electronic musical device based on your own interests. You will not bring it in because we're not going to NYU, but you will present it to the class on the last day of the semester. There will be small mini assignments built into your labs early on that are designed to get you thinking about what you want to do for your project. It is expected that this project will either one, go beyond the material covered in class, two, combine at least four or five circuits from class or some combination of one and two. Later in the semester, when we sort of understand a lot more stuff, we will hone your ideas into something that is, uh, manageable for the class. So uh, this week we're going to have you look at some old final projects and see what other people have done. Um, but we will start maybe in about the second half of the semester uh, seriously thinking about what you want to build. Your final project consists of successfully building your project, publicly posting your final project report, uh, for your report, you will do extensive documentation of your final project, including schematics, video, audio demos, and a thorough and scientific and mathematically accurate explanation of how the circuit works. Um, we're going to look at examples of this. This sounds a little bit daunting, um, but hopefully once you take a look at what people have done, you'll understand. The goal of this 
is to pass on your newfound skills and knowledge to future generations of intro to electronics students. Um, we hope that every semester people are uh, kind of taking it a step further, uh, building upon what students have done in the past. So we want to add your projects to this database. And so grading is pretty simple. Um, two thirds of this class is your lab reports. One third of this class is your final project. I subtract any attendance penalties and that is your grade. Uh, so not too much to it. Come to the class, do the homework, do the final project. You'll do fine. Um, it is expected that you will be in class on time every week this semester. This applies to the office hours. The only acceptable excuse is a medical emergency, family emergency, or official NYU function. An absence will be excused with a signed note from a physician, NYU faculty member, or family member. You are allowed one unexcused absence over the course of the semester. On your second unexcused absence, I deduct one letter from your final grade. On your third, you fail the course. Now, I understand that because this is remote, we maybe have the ability to reschedule, and I am amenable to that. However, there are two sections worth of students that all have their own schedule. So uh, rescheduling will be limited based on availability. So what I'd like to do is schedule your office hours at a time. Let's say you decide 10 a.m. on Tuesday. That is the time I'd like to have with you unless something comes up and you have to move it. Um, but I will talk to you one-on-one -on -one so that we can schedule our uh, in-person office hours for a time that works for you. Um, and also, because I'm in New York, I'd prefer that our office hours fall between the hours of, let's say, 10 a.m. and 6 p.m., um, just because, uh, you know, I don't want to have to do things on the weekends or in the evenings. Uh, so if we can work things out, that would be optimal for me. You have to be in class on time every week. You are allowed to be late once over the course of the semester. For every time you're late after that, 2.5 points will be deducted from your final grade. Uh, this is no joke. Students have had as much as 10 points deducted from their grades for coming in late. Um, this is going to be applicable to our office hours because there might be back-to-back -back office hours. So if you come in late and then somebody has office hours right after you, I can't go late with you. Um, so uh, this is going to depend a lot on scheduling, but if we schedule 10 a.m. on a Tuesday, please be there at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday. Um, and that's pretty much it for the syllabus. So not too much here. We're doing a lab report every week. We're doing a final project at the end of the semester. And you have to be in our office hours on time. This is my email address. I've emailed you a dozen times, so you should have it already. But feel free to email me with any questions. Um, You'll also be presumably in the analog lecture with Stephen Litt. Uh, if you are only enrolled in one class and not the other, uh, please let me know. You should be enrolled in both analog lab and analog lecture. Um, cool. Did I miss anything? Twitch, did I miss anything? Silence. Okay. Let's go over our parts and tools. I've sent this out probably four or five times. Um, I think everyone has at least received this email by now. Uh, so, remember, no textbook for this class. This is what we're going to be using. Um, so there are four suppliers here, Amazon, SparkFun, Small Bear Electronics, and Adafruit. Um, this list of things uh, are modified from past years because we've t done things like taken soldering out of the curriculum, um, and we've had to add some things like this uh, digital oscilloscope to replace 
the equipment that we're not able to use. Um, please, 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 if you haven't purchased these things yet, uh, go through this list and order them. You won't need all of this stuff for week one. I'm going to go over what you need uh, in just a minute. Another thing that I'd like to point out, um, for some of these Amazon items, the digital multimeter, uh, this thing, this is something we're going to be using this week. Um, NYU has offered to loan these out for the semester, but this is only applicable to uh, students who are in New York. If you are able to get to Steinhardt, um, you can rent one of these for the semester uh, and you won't have to purchase one. I would suggest, if, especially if you're someone who um, uses any sort of cables, you may as well just buy one. They're only about $12 and they're extremely useful. Um, if you've ever had an intermittent guitar cable or microphone cable, this thing comes in handy. Um, they could be up to $100. This one is about $12. It works really well. I'll be explaining this later in today's class. The other thing for this semester is this oscilloscope. Uh, this thing is about $26. It is a sad knockoff of the oscilloscopes that live in the Steinhardt lab, which cost thousands of dollars, but we won't be able to use. So our oscilloscopes workshop will consist of using this little guy and he is the $26 version of a larger oscilloscope. This is also an item NYU has offered to purchase if you are able to pick it up at the Steinhardt campus. So if you look at this list and think this is a lot of money, uh, I don't know if I can afford this stuff, um, you can get the oscilloscope and the multimeter on loan from NYU uh, for the semester and then return them at the end. Also, this Apple headphone adapter, uh, this is because we frequently run audio into our circuit, and a good source of audio is your phone. You can open up Spotify, play a song, but a lot of phones don't have an audio jack. So if you need some way to get audio out of your phone into a cable, right, this is a headphone cable, you might need to get this Apple headphone adapter. $7.99 seems like a lot of money, but Apple has a stranglehold on this stuff, so that's what it is. Uh, everything else you'll need to get, and um, I know earlier in the summer things were out of stock. This resistor kit uh, might be in stock now. Um, I got a notification, so just double check. There's another resistor kit here from Amazon. It's the same thing. You don't need both. You just need one of these. Um, I know some of you are in China, and I connected you with some faculty at NYU Shanghai. They should be able to help you source this stuff. Nothing on this list is terribly uh, obscure. You should be able to find it. Chances are it was shipped from China to these U.S. manufacturers, so chances are your list will be cheaper, um, but I don't really speak Mandarin, and I don't know a lot about uh, China suppliers. So if you need help finding things in China, just email me and I'll probably connect you with someone in China for that kind of stuff. So uh, let's go dive into this week's lesson. It's already been half an hour. Um, okay, let's go back again. All right, so week one, you can see there's a link to week one. Uh, these subsequent weeks don't have links yet, but you could go to last year's syllabus and click on them if you want to look ahead. Um, I'll probably be updating each week based on our progress uh, in this class. So that's why I didn't want to write the lessons just yet. Uh, so I'm going to click on week one. Introduction and Basic Circuit Prototyping with Breadboards, Schematics, and Multimeters. All right, now, before I start, 
I'm just gonna switch my camera and I'm gonna show you what you'll need for today's lesson. This is a breadboard. Um, there are many different kinds of breadboards. This one is probably a good size for this class. They also make smaller breadboards. Here's a little one with some stuff on it. It's like half the size. They also make bigger breadboards. Here's a gigantic breadboard, which is pretty much just a bunch of smaller breadboards put together. Um, you don't need a big one. You probably need more than the small one. So this is the one that I sent you in the link. You will also need a battery, nine volt battery. Looks like this. You'll also need this battery clip. Uh, you can see this one has bare wires at the end. They do make them with um, like plugs, but you'll need this so that you can get the power into this breadboard. You'll need some wire. Uh, I suggested getting these little jumper wires because they're really handy to use with breadboards. They just plug into these holes really easily. Um, wire is just metal in a plastic sleeve, so this is functionally the same as any other piece of wire. So if you have a spool of wire that you just wanted to cut into like little pieces, it's gonna do exactly the same thing. Um, some people opt to do that. Uh, if you decide to get a spool of wire, you'll probably need something like wire cutters, and you'll probably need something like wire strippers because you'll need to pull the end of that plastic off so you can get to the metal. The plastic is not conductive, only the metal part is. Uh, today is going to be intro to electronics and the easiest way to demo this is using LED lights. This is a red LED. This is a green LED. This is a blue LED. This is a yellow LED. I have a little LED variety pack and uh, they're really cheap. They cost about, you know, 10 cents a piece. Uh, you're probably going to break some of them in this class, and that's okay. That's why you got a pack of them. Um, they're really easy to burn out. That's totally fine. We're going to break some things, and that's totally fine. Um, make sure you have some LEDs before this class. Uh, if you don't have them, there is a store in New York called Tinker Sphere where you might be able to get some of the stuff. I'm not really sure what their COVID status is. Um, but LEDs are pretty common. You can find them almost anywhere. We're going to be using this little potentiometer. Uh, I'm going to explain what this does in a little bit. It's essentially a little knob. This part turns, so you can twist this back and forth. We're going to use this little toggle switch. This is really tiny, but this essentially just clicks back and forth on and off. These parts are included in your uh, parts kit, if you manage to get that from SparkFun. I'm also going to be using uh, a resistor today. Resistors are super tiny. Hold that up here. Uh, I suggested that you buy a kit with a lot of different ones in there. The one we're going to be using today is 1K, which is 1,000 ohms. And uh, there's a lot to resistors, so we're going to spend next week really diving into resistors. All you need to know today is that the one kilo ohm or the one K, is brown, black, red. If you can see the stripes on there, it's going to be kind of hard to tell. But you should see brown, black, red, and gold. If you have blue resistors, the uh, color scheme is a little bit different. Um, I'm not going to talk about blue resistors unless somebody actually gets them. You really want these tan resistors. This is really optimal for this class. Okay. Um, I believe that's everything you're going to need to complete week one. So uh, if you don't have some of the more obscure things, that's okay. We're going to not get into too much stuff today. Um, 
Let's go back to the lab. So, this is what a lab looks like. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in red. And this is so that if you go back to this site and just kind of skim it, the red italicized text will tell you what to do for homework. So this says, for your lab report this week, uh, include everything highlighted in red in a single, well-organized blog post on your WordPress blog. Please put everything in one post. If you take a video, uh, if you use YouTube or if you use Instagram, embed that video into your blog post. Please, 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 please do not send me Google Drive links. Uh, nine out of ten times, I don't have permission to open them. Um, there are many ways to get a video into WordPress, and if you need help, just email me and I can walk through some options. Uh, all of the week's lessons should be on one post, and you can send me a link to that post um, when you send it to me. If you draw schematics, uh, you can use an app like DocScan or similar to take a nice clear photo. Um, iPhones and Androids are pretty good, they're pretty good cameras these days, so you should be able to just snap a photo, make sure it's clear. If you can't read your handwriting, I'm not going to be able to read it, so um, please try and be legible, uh, especially when you're doing written assignments. Um, and send it to me with a link in the email with the subject analog lab, report one, report two, etc. So here's what we're going to learn. In this lab, we're going to learn how breadboards work. We're going to learn how to make your first basic analog circuits on your own breadboard and learn how your real life circuits relate to schematics. And then we're going to learn how to do some basic testing and troubleshooting with a multimeter. Uh, and so the multimeter that I mentioned earlier is also going to make an appearance. So uh, if you don't have access to this, but you do have access to the circuits, that's totally fine. Um, we're going to be using these next week a lot. So you really have to have one before week two uh, if you want to complete the assignment. So let's start uh, with breadboards. So for your first part of the lab, for your lab report, you're going to tell me in your own words what you've learned about how breadboards work and explain as if you're teaching this to someone who has never used one before. So let's take a look at this breadboard. So dating back to the 1970s, um, this is the tool that people use to prototype electronics because nothing in here is permanent, right? I can pop some wires in and I can move them around because these are just filled with these metal contacts that allow me to build and rebuild circuits. So before you have your custom circuit board, before you solder anything, this is going to be the first place that you design your circuit. Um, However, we need to know a little bit about how this grid works. So, the first thing I like to do is uh, split this breadboard into four parts. Uh, these two uh, edge pieces, and then this, all of this in the middle, which is split by this kind of cutout. So we have one, two, three, four sections. Functionally, the left-hand side is identical. It's like a mirror image from the left to the right. However, there's no connections through the middle of this breadboard. This is like a big divider. So nothing on the left is connected to anything on the right. Also, these columns on the sides are not connected to the middle. So this is an individual piece. 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 So, um, how these holes are connected. Let's take this piece by piece. On uh, the outer sides, these holes are all connected vertically, right? So basically, I like to think that this blue line, 
that is on the left is connecting all of these holes. If I plug anything into this top hole, right, like that, anything I plug in underneath, as long as it's in the same blue column, will be connected together, right? Basically, underneath this is a vertical uh, row of metal. So whatever I plug in gets connected, uh, everything in that blue line is connected together. Similarly, anything I connect into this red column is also connected to everything below it. Now, the red and the blue are not connected together, and this is important when we talk about voltage. So, uh, you have an individual blue column here and an individual red column next to it. And on the other side, you have another blue and another red column. You have four columns. Remember, this blue column is not connected to this blue column. And this red column is not connected to this red column. These are all individual columns. Um, later in the semester, we might do something like this, where we connect this blue to this blue. And now anything I plug into this blue column will also be connected to this blue column, right? Um, I'm not gonna do this just yet, but I just wanna foreshadow a little bit about how we can expand our breadboard functionality. So on the outsides, we have columns, right? Four individual columns, red, blue, red, blue. In the middle, we have rows. So one, two, three, four, five holes connected across. One, two, three, four, five holes connected across. Remember, these holes are not connected to these holes. This break divides this breadboard in half. So if I plug something into this first row, and then I plug another thing into that same row, they'll be connected together. If I put this under this vertically, they are in different rows. These two wires are not connected. Because remember, in the center, we're connected horizontally, right? Not vertically. Two things have to be in the same row on the same side to be connected. Over here, not connected, right? We have this break in the middle. So I can plug this wherever I want on this side, and no matter what, it will never be connected over here. There are numbers and letters on these breadboards. Mine says A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, and then these rows are numbered 1, 5, 10, 15, whatever. Forget all this. We're never going to refer to breadboard holes with the letters and numbers that are written on it. Um, as we start building circuits, uh, I think the breadboard functionality is going to be a little bit more clear. Um, this is one of the most confusing uh, things about, the, uh, about building circuits, is keeping your breadboard connections straight, right? So one more time. Vertical on the edges, horizontal in the middle, break down the middle, nothing is connected across, okay? By itself, this actually doesn't do anything. There's no power, there's no components. There is an adhesive on the back. I, I would suggest not peeling this off. Maybe later in the semester, if you build a final project, you'll wanna remove this and stick it in a box. But for right now, uh, you can just have this be loose. Um, but if you were to peel this off and like open it up, you'll just see columns and rows of metal. And that's all this thing is. It just lets us build circuits without having to have wires going everywhere, right? Um, so it makes our life a little bit easier. Okay, so for your lab report, tell me what you learned about how breadboards work. If you don't understand yet, we're gonna build some circuits and maybe it'll be a little bit clearer. Okay, so now we're going to start building circuits. 
we're going to build four circuits today, and the way we're going to do it is using schematics. Schematics are essentially just symbols that represent an electrical circuit. So, we're going to look at this first schematic together. There's a couple things going on here. Um, you can probably guess that this symbol with all these horizontal lines is our battery, because it says battery here. So I know I'm gonna need a nine volt battery uh, for this. I have this little lightning bolt symbol up here that says one K omega, uh, and this is the symbol for a resistor. Then I have this little triangle here with these arrows, and this is our LED. So basically, every component in analog circuits has a representation in schematics in a picture, right? Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to pull out the things that I need. I'm going to take out my battery, and I'm going to take out my battery clip because this is how I attach it. I'm going to take out a red LED, and I'm going to take out my 1K resistor. And this is all I need to make this first circuit. Okay. Also, you'll notice underneath the battery is this triangle. This denotes the ground of our circuit. Essentially, if I take a look at this battery, this battery tells me a couple things just from looking at it. It tells me it is 9 volts. That is the quantity of energy that this battery has. Uh, 9 volts is not a terrible lot of energy. Um, if you were to plug something into the wall, you'd get 120 volts. Um, so compared to that, this is not that dangerous. Um, if you try to shock yourself on this, it might be quite hard. Uh, I think you can touch your tongue and feel a little bit of tingling to these terminals, uh, but that's probably the most shock you'll get from this battery. Um, one thing that you have to note about circuits is that there is a plus side and a minus side to all of our power sources. And when we look at this battery, You'll see mine has a plus, oh, oh, where's my camera, there it is, right below the smaller terminal, right? So this is my positive side of the battery. The negative side doesn't tell me where it is. Um, but the cool thing is that this little battery clip, if I attach this, uh, since circuits were started, we've decided that Red wires are going to be used for positive uh, sides of the circuit, and black is going to be used for negative. If you ever jumped a car, you'll probably see similar color coding. Almost everything in electronics has red for positive and black for negative. So once I attach this, I don't even have to worry about which terminal is which, because I can assume that the red is my plus and the black is my minus. Um, so let's go back and take a look at the schematic. How uh, electricity works is we're going to start at the uh, top side of the battery. And I realize that you can't see my mouse. So we're going to start right above the battery where the plus sign is. That's how we know this is the red wire in my battery. And then we're just going to trace this. So I'm going to follow this line up and to the right, and I'm gonna hit my resistor. So in a schematic, these lines are just either wires or our breadboard rows. This is just metal that connects one component to another. So I know that the red wire in my battery is connected to this one kilo ohm resistor. And on the other side of that resistor, I'm connected to my LED. And then after the LED, I follow this line all the way down and back to the left, and it goes back to my battery. And this is the negative side of my battery. The negative side of my battery, at least in this circuit, 
is known as ground, which is why this gigantic arrow is here. Ground in an electrical circuit means there are zero volts left. And how this works is in a circuit, you have nine volts coming out of the positive side, and all nine of those volts must be consumed before I get back to the uh, negative side of my battery. So this resistor and this LED are consuming all nine of those volts. And then by the time I get back to the battery, I'm at zero. We're gonna get a little bit more into um, the laws with regard to voltage in a couple weeks. Um, but one thing that's very, very important is uh, never touching the plus and minus terminals of a battery together. Because if I do this, the nine volts are going to come out of this red wire and nothing is going to consume them. So if I were to touch these together, I'm going to create essentially a feedback loop where this is just going to get hotter and hotter. Uh, and this is what's called a short circuit. Now with a nine volt battery, nothing exciting is really going to happen. You're going to deplete your battery really fast. So if you don't want to have to buy new batteries, don't do it. Um, the general rule for this class is if you feel your battery getting hot, just pop it off and try and figure out if your red and black wires are touching anywhere. Because if they are, you have a short circuit. And you're going to burn your battery out, you're going to damage an LED or something else. Um, there will not be any fires, unfortunately. Sorry to those who are looking to start them. Uh, but you're going to just break things and you'll need to get new ones. So for the, you know, to preserve the life of your battery, don't create a short circuit. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave my battery unattached for right now. I'm going to take the red wire and I'm going to pop it in to the red column like that. And I'm going to take the black wire and I'm going to pop it into the blue column. I know, it should be a black, but it is not. Now, I'm just going to like let that hang out off screen. But essentially what's happening now is this whole red line is going to have my 9 volts. And this whole blue line is going to have 0 volts, or ground. And so what we're going to do now is we're able to plug in anything to these columns to attach to our battery. This gives us a lot of options, right? We don't need a whole lot of options, we only have two things. But in a more complicated circuit, we might have many things that need to be plugged into power or ground. And this gives us all of those holes to do that. So, got our battery plugged in. We've got power only on this column. Remember, we don't have anything on this column. So we're not going to use it. We're only going to use this side. All right. Next thing is a resistor. Now my resistor is plugged into the battery on this side and the LED on the other side. Resistors uh, they don't have orientation. It doesn't matter if I plug it in this way or this way, right? I can flip this over. I can use either side. I said we're going to get into resistors next week, but uh, I just want to talk to you about why we're using this here. Basically, what we're trying to do is light this LED up. Well, an LED only needs about one and a half volts to light up. So what's going to happen is if I were to just plug this LED into this battery and send 9 volts into this LED, it's going to break because it can handle about 1.5 volts. But if you put a whole 9 volt battery in, it's going to break. So what a resistor does is it consumes voltage depending on how big it is. This is a uh, 1,000 ohms, or 1 kilo ohm, 
and ohms are represented by this omega symbol. Uh, and next week, we're going to just talk more about different uh, values of resistor. But for today, I'm going to take my one kilo ohm resistor, and I'm going to plug one end into the red column, right? Pretty much anywhere under where our red wire is. My other side, I'm just going to plug it into a random row somewhere in the middle. You can bend this. These are just kind of wires, so you can make this as small as you want. I'm just going to pick a row kind of nearby, and um, I'm going to bend it a little bit so you can see it. So I've got one side into the red column, and the other one is just in another row that I picked arbitrarily. It doesn't really matter um, because I have not yet completed the circuit. Okay. My last part that I need is my LED, uh, which stands for light emitting diode. Uh, basically, uh, these were invented as a low power solution for lighting. Uh, you probably know about LEDs. They're in almost everything these days. Super cheap, um, super low energy, uh, and also really easy to demonstrate circuits. Now, here's the thing about LEDs. It does matter, the orientation of LEDs. If you'll notice, this might be hard to show you on this camera, uh, I've got one short leg and one long leg on this LED. So this is true of all LEDs. If I pull out the yellow one or the blue one, they all have one long leg and one short leg. This tells you which side is positive and which side is negative. So when I look at my schematic, I know the positive side is connected to the resistor and the negative side connects all the way around back to our battery. On the physical LED, the short leg is the negative leg and the long leg is the positive leg. So what I'm gonna do first is I know the short leg, which is negative, is going to eventually make it back to my battery. So I'm going to take the short leg and plug it directly in to the blue column of my breadboard. Right? You can see how it's in a different column than my resistor. The resistor is connected under the red line, the LED is under the blue line. Now to complete this circuit, I'm going to take the long leg and plug it into the same row as this resistor. And when I do this, I have a complete circuit, but remember nothing's happening because I didn't plug my battery in yet. So let's see if I did it correctly. Well, that's pretty anticlimactic. Maybe this battery's dead. Let's try a different battery. Let's try a different LED. Cool. All right, so maybe I have some dead batteries, which is maybe something I should have checked. Let's see. How's my voltage? I'm going to demo this in a little bit, but this will maybe tell me. Oh yeah, that's a dead battery. Let's throw that away. How about this battery? That's another dead battery. Cool. Glad I checked these in advance. All right. Let's see if I've got anything here that will work for today's lesson. We've got another one here. That's nine volts. All right. So pretend none of that happened. We're going to attach our battery here, and boom, we've got an LED that's lit up. So
So, if I go back, uh, you'll notice something about this circuit, which is it is a circle. Uh, that's a metaphor I like to use, circuit is a circle. Um, if I were to disconnect any part of this circuit, I will lose power. So if I disconnect one of these battery wires, power goes out. If I disconnect this resistor, power goes out, right? I must have everything going from the positive through our components back to the negative. Now I know this doesn't look like the schematic, and that's sort of part of the challenge of understanding how this stuff works. You have, uh, you're translating our schematic into our breadboard, right? Okay, so I'm gonna give you a couple minutes if you are watching this on a recording to get your LED working. Uh, you probably don't have a dead battery, so if it isn't working, try flipping the LED around. Uh, make sure that these are in the same row. Make sure that your resistor is in the positive column and your LED is in the negative column. And then once you have an, a lit up LED, we'll move to the next lesson. Okay, we've added a new component. This in the middle, in between our resistor and the LED, this is a toggle switch. You'll notice it has three circles. There's one on the left and two on the right. Basically, if you think about a switch like a railroad switch, because we're all familiar with how railroads work, uh, the train hits this location, the first circle, and then it has the option to go to this top track or to this bottom track. You'll notice this top track has nothing going to it, right? Only when it's connected to the bottom track will this LED turn on, which is why this is an on-off switch. When this switch is in the top position, it is a broken circuit, so we won't see the LED lit up. So, let's see how this looks in... Uh, in practice. I'm going to just take the uh, resistor and the LED out. I'm going to keep my battery here, just so that I always have power in here. And I'm going to pull out my little toggle switch. This switch has three pins, right? And how this works is the middle pin of this switch is our, what's called, common pin. When the switch is in the top position, the middle gets connected to the top. When this is in the bottom position, the middle is connected to the bottom, right? So I can switch my middle pin between two tracks, top and bottom, right? Now, I want to place this on the breadboard so each position of this switch has its own row. This is really important. I'm going to give you a minute to place this switch into the breadboard, and I want you to try it and see if you can do it correctly. Okay. If you did this, You are incorrect. Why? Well, remember, all of the holes in the middle are connected together. So if I were to plug all three of these pins into the same row, I've just connected them all together. This won't do anything, right? In order to use the functionality of this switch, I need to make sure that each pin is in a different row. Right? Does this make sense? I also, if I wanted to connect this to the battery and I did this, this is also incorrect, right? Because now I've connected all three switch pins to the positive side of my battery, right? So, I'm going to pick three rows in the middle and pop my switch in here. 
I can still toggle it up and down. Not connected to anything yet. Uh, but let's use this with the circuit we built before and see if we can turn the LED on and off using this switch. Okay, so not terribly different from the first lesson. We're going to connect our resistor to the positive side of the battery, but then the other side of the resistor is actually going to connect to the middle of our switch. Remember, the middle of our switch is our... Uh, common pin. It's the one that toggles between top and bottom. So I'm going to take my resistor. I'm going to do what I did before. I'm going to plug it into any hole in this red column. And the other side, I'm going to go into the middle of my switch. I might have to lift the switch up a little bit because it's kind of hard to see where the pins are because this plastic kind of covers it up, but I'm going to connect the resistor to the middle of the switch. And then I'm going to take my LED and I'm going to take the positive leg of the LED and connect it to either the top or the bottom. It doesn't really matter as long as the LED is connected to one and then the short leg of the LED goes back to the battery. So just like I did before. I'm going to start by putting the short leg of this LED into the negative, and then I'm just going to put this into, I'm going to choose the row below the resistor. So let's see. Currently my switch is in the up position. If I switch it down, LED turns on. If I switch it up, LED turns off. Pretty easy. If your LED is not turning on and off, make sure that your LED and your resistor are not sharing a row. If they share a row, then it's like the, the first uh, circuit, right? The switch isn't even there because they're already connected. It doesn't matter that the switch is here. I'm going to give you a minute to kind of troubleshoot this. See if you can get your switch going on and off. And then we'll move on to the next one. Okay. Getting into a little bit of a complicated territory now. So, this looks a little more intense than it actually is. We've only introduced one new part. If we follow this, starting at the battery, right, our battery is now connected directly to our switch, and then we've moved the resistor right after that. Then we see what looks like another resistor, a 10K, with an arrow in the middle and that arrow is connected to the LED. And then I have this other weird thing going on where this 10K part is also connected to the negative side of the battery. See this little junction at the bottom? Um, so let's see if we could figure out how this works. And what we're going to do is introduce the potentiometer. So a potentiometer is essentially just a resistor that you can change the value by turning it, right? And how you can think about this is uh, the middle pin is the one that moves. It basically, when you turn it all the way to the right, the middle pin is connected to the right pin. If you turn it all the way to the left, the middle pin is connected to the left pin. And if you, if you put it right at 12 o'clock, you have kind of two equal resistors between the middle and the left and the middle and the right. So because this is a 10K resistor, you would have 5K and 5K, right? If I turned it all the way to the left, I would basically have 10K between the middle and the right, and then zero because, right, they're connected together, so there's no resistance. So basically, what we're using this for is uh, as a dimmer. 
we're creating a resistance that is going to cause our LED to dim and go back to full brightness. So let's take out all these parts and just kind of put them on the side. So we have four components now. I'm going to leave my battery still plugged in. So let's start with the switch. We're going to start always at the positive, work our way clockwise. Well, okay, immediately I see an issue here, which is I have to connect the middle pin of the switch to the plus of the battery. Well, how can I do this? I can't really put this in here because I've connected all the rows together, and I can't really bend this like a resistor because these legs are super stubby. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna put this in to the breadboard just like we did before. And we're going to take our other very useful tool that we have, which is a wire. And I'm gonna get a red wire just so that I kind of am keeping our um, standards correct, right? Uh, let me see if I have one here. Because this is connected to power, uh, I wanna use a red wire. This looks like what you've got in the kit, but it's really big, so I'm just gonna use this little wire that I've got, which is also red, but it doesn't take up so much space on my breadboard. I'm gonna plug it into the positive column, and I'm gonna plug it into the middle pin of my switch. All right. So now, my positive voltage is going into the middle of my switch and I can divert it into the top or the bottom pin depending on what I want to do, right? Next, I have my resistor. So just like we did before, we're gonna connect one side to the switch, either on the top or the bottom, and the other side looks like it gets connected to my potentiometer. So I'm gonna, let's do that in just a minute, but I'm gonna just connect to the resistor. I'm gonna use the bottom, and then I'm just gonna pick another row down here. It's a little far away so that I can connect that. So let's see, let's bring this up so you can kind of see it closer. So I've got my power going into the middle of my switch and then the resistor going into the bottom. Now, let's take a look at this potentiometer. Remember how I said the middle pin is the one that moves up and down? When we turn this, the middle pin is the one that moves. That is this arrow that's connected to the middle. So basically, the top of my potentiometer is connected to my resistor. The bottom looks like it goes back to the battery, because I'm tracing this along. Uh, and the middle is connected to the LED. So, similar to my switch, I'm going to choose three rows, right? Because I don't want to connect these together, I want to use different rows. But the top pin is going to go into the same row as my resistor. Because remember I just popped that resistor into a random row? So I'm going to press this in so that the resistor is in the top row. And then I have the middle and the bottom available. Remember, three pins in three different rows. If you put them all in the same row, they're all connected together, it won't work. Make sure they're in three different rows. Okay, now, we're going to connect the middle to our LED. Pretty much the same thing we've done for the last two circuits. We're going to put the long leg into the middle pin of the potentiometer uh, and then the short leg into the negative side of our battery. So, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to turn this off for now because I want to kind of demo how this works. Now, we're not quite done. Even though this did light up, I want to show you something. 
It's going to be hard to see here, but I can make this max brightness. But when I turn this the other way, that's max brightness, when I turn it the other way, it never quite goes off. And the reason for that is we've not connected the bottom of this to anything. It's just kind of connected to a row with nothing in it. So what I'm going to do, if I look at my schematic here, the bottom of this potentiometer, the 10K, is connected to the same row as ground, right? So I'm going to take a wire, and this time I'm going to take a black wire, because black is the color we use for ground or negative. And I'm going to connect the bottom row of that potentiometer to ground, the negative side of the battery. And now, I can turn my LED on, and I can turn it all the way off to zero, right? So, no, this isn't the most ideal thing, but I'm going to kind of put this up to the camera so you can kind of see what's going on here. We've got the power going into the middle of the switch. We've got the resistor going from the bottom of the switch into the top of the potentiometer. We've got the LED coming out of the middle of the potentiometer to ground. And then the bottom of the potentiometer I'm also connecting to ground. Okay? So, if you built this correctly, you should be able to fade this up and down. You should also be able to turn this on and off using the switch that we wired up earlier. So we've got a dimmer, and we've got an on-off switch. All right. I'm going to give you all a minute, and then we'll start on our last circuit. Questions from the Twitch? Questions from the Discord? So, this is going to be the most complex circuit of the day. All we have done is added another LED. You'll notice all the rest of this is the same, but the uh, kind of orientation is different. Before I explain what this does, I want you to just kind of take a guess. If your guess was a crossfader, you are right. This potentiometer is going to crossfade between two LEDs. Let's take a look. Here's our normal on-off switch. Then we hit our resistor. However, now our resistor is connected to the middle of the potentiometer. So when I turn it all the way to the left, or all the way to the top, I'm going to light up this top LED. When I turn it all the way to the bottom, I'm routing all the power to the bottom LED. This is exactly how a crossfader in music works. If you have two channels of audio and you want to crossfade between them, you can use a passive component like a potentiometer to do that. Um, we're not going to get into music this week, but uh, let's build this LED crossfader. Uh, one thing to note, um, it's probably ideal if you use two identical colored LEDs because some LED colors draw more power than others, and it won't be a total 50-50 balance of brightness. So I'm going to grab another red LED. Feel free to use two greens or two blues. As long as they're the same color, you'll get the right effect. Now, if I look at this circuit, it's pretty much the same up to the resistor, right? Like if I scroll up here, I have the 9-volt battery, the switch, and the resistor. So all I'm going to remove here is everything after the resistor. We could build this from scratch again, but I'm kind of pontificating a lot, and I don't want to make this too long. We're going to pull out this LED. We're going to pull out this ground cable, and we're going to pull out the potentiometer. So basically, the beginning of my circuit is the same, right? 
we have power going into the switch and then we're going into the resistor. So, now I'm going to plug my resistor into the middle of the potentiometer. Right? So I'm going to line this up so that the middle pin is connected, just like that. I don't know if you can see that, but basically that's going in the middle instead of the top. Now, all I have here are two LEDs. The positive side is connected to the potentiometer and the negative side goes to ground, right? Both LEDs, you'll notice, get connected to ground. So this is actually a little bit easier than the previous circuit because I don't need an extra wire. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna bend this resistor out of the way a little bit. I'm going to take one LED from the top to ground and my second LED from the bottom to ground, remember to uh, use the short leg to go to ground and the long leg to go to the potentiometer. Now, my on off switch should still work. I didn't change that. When I'm on, now I'm crossfading from one LED to the other. Right? As I turn this, the brightness swaps. That's all there is to it. Let me give you one more minute to get that working. Essentially, what's happening here, right, is we've got this 10 kilo ohms of resistance. And sometimes we've got 10 kilo ohms between our power and the bottom LED, in which case it's not going to light up. And sometimes I've got 10 kilo ohms between the top LED and the power, which means that one's not going to light up. All I'm doing is changing the resistance so that our voltage either lights up the bottom or the top LED. So... I want you to uh, build all of these circuits. If you haven't been building them, um, I think it's probably advantageous to kind of follow along with the video and build circuits as you go, um, because for your homework, you're going to build upon this last circuit that we built. Before I introduce the homework, um, let's just talk about schematics for a second. So we've been basically looking at schematics. These are circuit diagrams that all designers use. They use standardized symbols and follow a simple set of rules and they make it extremely easy to share your designs and check with others. Uh, if you open up this Wikipedia page, you can look at a bunch of different electronic symbols that exist. Um, we're probably not gonna use a vast majority of these you can see there's different forms of ground. So you may have seen these like three horizontal lines. You may have seen this kind of pitchfork shaped thing. Um, these are different power supplies. So batteries, voltage sources, usually depending on what you're using for power, you get a different uh, voltage source. Uh, different resistors. If you're based in Europe, you might have this rectangular resistor rather than the lightning bolt shape. I'm going to blow this up a little bit so you can quite see it. So these are the resistors that are pretty common in America, but you might see these rectangles. It's the same thing. Um, capacitors we're going to get to in a couple weeks. Diodes we'll also talk about. Uh, I would advise just skimming this Wikipedia page. If you've ever looked at a circuit uh, diagram or a schematic, you may have seen some of the stuff. These are... Um, MOSFETs and transistors, um, vacuum tubes, pretty much everything that is part of a circuit can be drawn in uh, a schematic form, right? Uh, I would also say, if you are a music and audio gear enthusiast, Google a company schematics. So like, uh, Anybody in the chat got a got a good company they want to Google? 
Usually this is some fun class participation. We don't have that though. Let's try uh, Big Muff Schematic. So if you're not a guitar player, the Big Muff is sort of one of the most common distortion pedals, fuzz pedals. And you can see, if I search Big Muff Schematic, I've already got a lot of results. I'm just gonna click on the images and we can take a look. These are most likely mods. Um, very few pedals will release their schematics, but a lot of people will build clones and release those. So if I take a look at this, let's see. So here we go. Let me zoom in a little bit. So, there's probably a lot going on here that you're not gonna understand, and that's okay. By the end of this semester, this should be pretty easy to understand. But even from an hour and a half, you should be able to identify this nine volt battery over here, all the way on the left. There's a bunch of resistors that are labeled. R13 is 39K, here's R22, R23. All of these R's are different resistors and they have values labeled. So you can imagine after a couple of weeks of reading schematics, you'll be able to just kind of Google your favorite guitar pedal and um, assuming you have the right parts, you can whip up your own clone of um, any pedal you want. Um, if you're into this kind of stuff, find some interesting schematics and we can talk about them. Um, because, you know, I'd be interested in looking at some new stuff. Okay, so, here's what you're going to do for homework. Notice this part of the lab is in red. For your lab report, you're going to recreate circuit four. And then you're going to add more stuff so that when you switch the LEDs controlled by the potentiometer off, it switches another LED on. So basically, here's our crossfader. Remember the train metaphor we used earlier? And the top track we're not using? Now I want you to use the top track. I want you to have a third LED. Remember, you need a resistor because this resistor is, this 1K, is limiting the voltage to this crossfader. But if I switch, I don't have a resistor up here. So if I just connected another LED, I'm gonna send all nine volts to that LED and it's gonna burn out. So what I want you to do is simplify the circuit so it only needs one resistor. Think a little bit about how voltage works and see if you can rearrange things so that you only need one 1K resistor. Then you're going to add a photo cell. Um, rather than click on this link, I'm just going to show you what a photo cell looks like. This is a photo cell. It's got some squiggly lines on it. And this is essentially a photosensitive resistor. So, kind of like how with a potentiometer, when you turn this, it changes the resistance. With a photocell, when you change the amount of light, it changes the resistance. So, this should come in your uh, parts box with all the rest of the stuff. And what I want you to do is uh, add a photocell that controls the brightness of your new LED. So, three parts to this. You're gonna add a third LED, that's connected to the other side of the switch. You're going to rebuild your circuits. So you only need one resistor. Then you're gonna add a photo cell that controls the brightness of your new LED. Okay? The crossfader that we built is still functional. So you don't take this apart. You're just going to add to it. Once you do this, you're going to take a video of the circuit working and post it on your lab report. 
Uh, as a note, you'll be uploading a lot of short video demos. The easiest way is to upload to YouTube and embed it in your blog. Uh, actually, in the last couple semesters, I've had students create a new Instagram account for this class, which is also fine. Um, just please embed your Instagram videos in the blog so that I don't have to monitor two different things. Uh, your blog post should have everything, uh, the video, the schematic, uh, everything you need. Then you're going to draw schematics for your new circuit and post a photo of it. I would suggest uh, maybe doing this by hand, pen and paper. There are circuit softwares that I'm going to talk about uh, eventually, but uh, I'd rather you just draw this by hand for this assignment. Uh, it's perfectly acceptable to draw by hand and take a, a scan or photo of them. You can also use your phone's camera, just make sure it's 100% readable. Um, I'm not taking points off. If you get this wrong, I want you to just give this a try. We're going to be drawing schematics for most labs, so um, I want you to just practice and get better at it. Uh, for the photo cell, if you click on this symbol, this is what it looks like. You know what, this is not what it looks like. <laughs> Let's just Google photo cell schematic. And essentially, it's a resistor inside of a circle with arrows pointing at it uh, because light is coming in as opposed to light exiting like an LED. Uh, so, eh, too much. Let's go back. I just want to look at this image. So yeah, this is a photo cell, a resistor in a circle, lights pointing at it. Don't worry about this circuit over here. I don't know what they're doing, but this is how you draw a photo cell. All right. So that's really um, the big part of this week's lab is building this, taking the video of it working and drawing the schematic. Um, I sometimes will give out bonuses. I know labs are out of five points, but uh, we will have an extra point in this lab. And um, I would suggest doing the bonuses because if you get points off, this might offset that in the future. So if you find that this is really easy, try to add anything else to your circuit that does anything and report back on successes or failures. Like maybe you can try adding a push button instead of a switch. Um, try to do things, uh, let me know what happens. This is pretty open-ended, so it's an easy point to get. Um, try and use some of the other stuff in your kit. Uh, don't try to like program a digital chip. It's gonna be too much, but um, you know, within reason. Okay, so that is really most of uh, the assignment. If you scroll through here, there's a lot of text in red that you can cycle through. All the schematics are listed here in lab one and I'll post this video uh, once it's done recording to the lab as well. There's a couple other things that we're gonna do. Um, we're gonna talk about multimeters uh, and I'm gonna talk about multimeters briefly because we're gonna be using them starting next week, but uh, there are some really valuable things here that I think are useful. So, this is a multimeter. I'm just going to move this over a little bit. And I'm actually going to unplug this so I don't kill my battery. I'll leave this on all day. Uh, multimeters have a lot of functions, and I'm not going to talk about all of them today. Um, this is one that comes from Amazon. It's also available in a lot of hardware stores. They're uh, mostly the same. Um, some of them are a little more expensive. One thing is that we have these probes at the bottom, and you'll notice the black probe is connected where it says COM for common, 
make sure that's always plugged in there. And my red probe right now is plugged into what says V, omega, MA, and a square wave. And this basically pretty much means most of our functionality is this port. We're going to eventually use this left port uh, when we get to current, but don't worry about this for a couple weeks. So we're going to plug these in. And the first thing I'm going to do is show you how to test for connectivity. And the symbol is this little sound wave in the bottom right. So I'm going to click this all the way here. And uh, when I have this set to this setting, I'm going to take the other ends of my probes, and I'm just going to touch them together. And you'll hear a beep. I don't know if you could hear that on the, on the stream. Essentially, that means these two things are connected together. Now, how is this useful? Well, let's say I'm testing my circuit, and I want to see if something is connected to ground. Well, what I can do is I can touch anything in this column, and I can just check to see if things are connected to ground, right? And because these are in the same column, I know they're connected, right? So I hear that beep. And if I touch this somewhere else, that lights up because it's kind of carrying power, but uh, I'm not hearing anything, right? Where else is this useful? Well, let's say you've got a guitar pedal cable that's intermittent, right? I can check to see if this is connected by kind of touching both sides, right? And if my cable is working and I don't have any breaks, it will beep. That's the sleeve. I'm also going to touch the tip, and you'll kind of hear the same thing, right? So this is an extremely useful tool when you're doing cable testing because you can just tell if a cable is working uh, just by doing a continuity test. So we're going to use the continuity test feature a lot throughout the semester. Um, the other thing I'm going to show you today, which is what I used earlier when I had all those dead batteries, is the uh, voltage measurement. Now you'll notice on the left side I see a V with a straight line. On the right side I see this V with a tilde. So these are two different kinds of voltage. This is DC voltage on the left, and this is AC voltage on the right. We're almost never going to use AC voltage, because AC voltage is what comes out of the wall. We're not going to use it. We're going to use the DC side. Now, this is a little bit confusing, because there's a bunch of different numbers here. So we see 200 M, 2000 M, these are millivolts, so 200 millivolts, 2000 millivolts, then I see 20 volts, 200 volts, and 500 volts. So I'm going to measure my 9 volt battery, and to do this, I need to set this to a number that's greater than the voltage I'm measuring. So in this case, I'm going to set it to 20. Blurry, 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 I'm back. See. Let's remove this autofocus. Come on. There we go. Okay. I'll come back. Cameras are fun. All right. So it's set to the 20, right? Now, I can take anything less than 20 volts and measure it. Now, I'm not going to look at the battery. I'm just going to pick two terminals. And it says 8.96, right? Now check this out. If I swap these, I get negative 8.9. Because my black probe is my reference point. So if I put my black probe on the negative, and then I measure positive voltage, I get positive voltage. But if I put this at the positive end, and I measure negative, I get negative voltage. 
And that's because voltage uh, is a quantity, and depending on how I measure it can determine whether it's positive or negative. I'm not going to get too much into this, but we're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks when we get into bipolar power supplies. But just know that I can have plus 9 volts or negative 9 volts out of this battery. And I can also split this battery down the middle and I can have plus 4.5 and minus 4.5 volts and my zeros in the middle. Um, so I can divide up this voltage as much as I want. But what's in this battery is 9 and... Uh, you should measure your battery. You will have somewhere between 8.7 and 9.4 volts. If you measure your battery and you've got like 7 volts, you should probably get a new battery. Uh, throughout the semester, inevitably, some of you will short your batteries and you'll need new ones. Um, I would suggest measuring them time to time, like I did in this class, to make sure you have enough volts. Uh, we're also going to talk about measuring resistance. We're going to get into that next week, but you'll see the omega symbol here, and there's all of these values for resistance that I can set this to. Uh, and just for, you know, demonstration purposes, I'm going to measure uh, my 1K resistor here. So I'll set this to 2,000, which is greater than 1,000, and we'll see 9... 972, pretty close. So uh, next week we're doing a lot of measuring resistors, so get yourself a multimeter if you don't have one. Uh, I noticed somebody in Discord asked about borrowing them from the university. Uh, I will follow up with you personally about that. Uh, I need to just basically give your NYU net ID to the university so that they can put a set aside. Um, so I can email with you or chat on Discord, and we can get that all straightened out if you want to borrow one from the university. Um, you don't need to get this exact multimeter. They all are pretty similar in how they operate. Try not to spend less than, like, $9 on one because they do make really cheap ones in hardware stores. Um, but if you get one that looks like this, it'll do the trick. You don't need the one on Amazon. Um, they're all pretty similar. One last note. This hold button, if you press it, uh, you won't be able to do anything. So if you have a little H in the corner, uh, that is just locked. So just make sure you're not on hold if you want to use this. I think this one also has a little backlight, which is nice. You know, you can get one with a backlight or not. Um, don't leave your multimeter on or you'll kill the battery. So that's pretty much that. Uh, Obviously, there's a lot more to multimeters that I'm not explaining today, and as we cover more concepts, we're going to talk about more of the features. But for this week, I want you to tell me about multimeters, the same way you told me about breadboards. Um, maybe you want to watch some YouTube videos and see what else they can do. Uh, so I'll let you kind of uh, do that on your own. Okay, two more things and then we're done. Uh, next part. A huge part of this class is building circuits and making mistakes. You're going to mess things up. So, uh, what I want you to do, in addition to your assignments, I want you to keep a log. And uh, this can either be a section of your weekly report or a totally different log. Anytime that you learn something new or realize you made a silly mistake, I want you to jot it down. Uh, and keep this for the semester. Um, I'm going to check it every now and then and make sure you're updating it. This is going to be really useful at the end when you're doing your final project to look at things and be like, oh, maybe I plugged in the wrong leg of the LED. Maybe I, you know, put the switch in the row horizontally instead of vertically. Anytime you realize that you messed something up, write it down and keep a troubleshooting log. So, you're going to have a section of your lab report called Analog Circuit Troubleshooting where you list every mistake that you make and you're going to update this throughout the semester. So um, figure out how you want to organize this, send it to me this week, and just keep it in your mind to keep this updated because it's going to help you to get better at building circuits. Okay, last thing. We're going to talk about final projects. and I realize that this semester is probably going to be a little bit different based on how we're doing this remotely, um, but 
I have some links here to some past final projects for this semester. What I want you to do is check out a few of these um, and write about three or more that you think are interesting. So um, there is a long list here. They span anything from guitar effects to, uh, you know, vocal. Uh, somebody made a um, de -er one semester. Um, people make some really crazy stuff, so I want you to just kind of look at this list and see what people are building for this semester. Um, these are the final lab reports. So when you click on one of these, you're going to see what a final report should look like. And this is probably good to see, you know, what people are doing. So we have basic explanation, we have a video, uh, we have an audio demo, here's a SoundCloud link, here's another SoundCloud link, these are different parts. Um, this person breaks these apart into different circuits and kind of talks about what each one does, and here's schematics for each one. Um, so I'm just going to kind of quickly scroll through this. Obviously this is going to be too advanced for this class, but you can get an idea of like the complexity of some of these final projects. So we're going to get through all of these different parts. And then at the bottom, we're going to see the full circuit at some point. There we go. Everything attached together. Um, and, you know, that is pretty much what we expect out of a final. So, you know, like I said earlier, you're either doing like a combination of four to five different circuits or going beyond the scope of this class to build something interesting. So um, I'm not going to get into any of these because I really want you to explore these on your own, but I want you to go through several of these and um, let's say three, watch the videos, write about what's interesting to you and what inspired you about them and what you might want to do for this class. Um, and that is it. That's it for week one. So there's a lot of stuff to set up uh, for this class. You have to set up your WordPress. You have to make sure you have the parts necessary to build these circuits. If you have any issues with either of those, please email me, message me on Discord. I'll be checking the Discord server. Um, bookmark our lab uh, page because we'll be using this throughout the semester. Um, and... Yeah, please let me know if you have any questions uh, about any of this material. I'm going to reach out to all of you individually about setting up office hours. Um, so feel free to uh, email me. We will have class at the scheduled time this week. Uh, Monday's class will happen on Wednesday. So this Wednesday is a Monday schedule. Um, for, I think, because of Labor Day. So I will have class Wednesday morning at 9.30 in the morning and Friday morning at 9.30 in the morning. We're going to talk about all this stuff, and I'm going to give you this video. Uh, and then from then on, it's going to be a check-in, and we'll be doing office hours. So please come to this week's class, and then we'll do office hours moving forward, and I'll keep doing videos like this if you would like me to change anything about how I'm doing this format. Uh, this is new to me as well. Please let me know. Uh, I'm happy to, you know, get better lighting or audio if my voice is not legible or the circuits are not legible. I'll try to improve this where I can. Um, it's going to be a weird semester, but we're going to get through it, and I'm excited to see what you guys are going to build. So I will talk to you in the Discord, and I'll see you in class this week. Thanks.